For today's short circuit, I thought I'd take a longer leap back in time and have a look at a tube circuit, the cathode follower. Now this circuit is most likely one of the least understood of tube circuits out there, which is really quite odd as it's one of the simplest of all tube circuits in terms of components and hookup. All you need to build the circuit is a valve, in this case we're using a triode, and a single resistor attached to the cathode going to ground. Now before I dive into the inner workings of a cathode follower, Let's have a quick review of the typical operating conditions of a triode. We start off with a very large positive charge on the plate, then a negative charge relative to that positive charge on the cathode. We also have a heater. Now that's going to boil off electrons in the cathode that are going to be very negatively charged, and these are going to be attracted to the positive charge on the plate. Now if we pass in a signal onto the grid, that will modulate the stream of electrons flowing off the cathode, in the following manner. So as the signal goes more positive, the stream of negative electrons coming off the cathode can move freely through the grid and onto the plate. Conversely, as the signal goes more negative, the stream of electron is repelled by the grid and not as many make it to the plate. Now this modulated stream will appear as an amplified version of the original signal across the load resistor here. The one thing to really take away is that that signal is always 180 degrees out of phase of the input. Now to create a cathode follower, all we have to do is remove the load resistor and take our signal from across the cathode resistor. Now since the cathode is highly negative, taking the output voltage from the cathode resistor will now oppose the signal voltage. So as the signal goes negative, the output will also go negative. And likewise, as the signal goes positive, the output will also go positive. Now in the old days, they used to call this a degenerative amplifier. And since the transistor age started, it's now known by its more common negative feedback. Now this is where the circuit also takes its name. The output voltage follows the input voltage, hence cathode follower. Now is a good time to ask the question, why use this circuit at all? Well, to the engineer, this circuit has a number of very useful properties. Now I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail on the properties, as engineers love math, and to work out all these properties usually takes pages and pages of math problems. So in no particular order, the properties are, the output and input signals are always in phase. There is very little distortion in the signal because of the negative feedback. The gain of the amplifier is always less than one. It has high input impedance. It has low output impedance, and an extremely wide frequency response, all the way from DC up to five megacycles. Now I first ran into the circuit when I was reviewing the circuit diagram of a Hickok Model 288X RF generator, one of my future projects. Now the Hickok manual clearly described the circuit as a cathode follower. Now I just could not wrap my head around what the purpose of this cathode follower was in the RF generator. So after reading everything I could find on cathode followers, I still didn't have any understanding of what the circuit was supposed to do. I then, of course, watched a whole bunch of YouTube videos, and all I got was all sorts of math, and even more confused, because, like I said at the beginning, this circuit is usually not understood by anybody on the interweave anymore. So as a last resort, I brought the manual and circuit diagram of the RF generator down to the radio club, and asked two of the old guys at the club. And in about five minutes, they explained to me exactly what's going on. The signal from the main oscillator goes in through this coupling capacitor, Next is the grid resistor, which helps set up the bias of the tube. And of course, we have our cathode resistor down here. And we take our signal off that resistor through this capacitor here, which couples it to the next stage. Finally, we have this capacitor attached to the plate and then to ground. And that bleeds off any stray RF that might make its way onto the plate and hence onto the B+. Looking at the block diagram, you can see how the signal from the variable oscillator goes into the cathode follower. And then from the cathode follower, it goes into the FM oscillator, where it's reused in the modulation section. At the same time, the output of the cathode follower also goes into the output modifier, where it can be selected as output via the output control. Now, first and foremost, the engineers that design this RF generator are using the impedance properties of the cathode follower to great advantage. Because of the high impedance of the cathode follower, 
the signal coming out of the variable RF oscillator is not affected to any degree by the cathode follower. As well, the signal coming out of the cathode follower is largely distortion free and of course in phase with the signal coming from the RF oscillator. Thus, by using a cathode follower, the engineers have removed the need to have two other oscillators in the RF generator. The main benefits being we save on parts, at least one tube. You also have a much more stable instrument because you don't need to keep three oscillators in phase and at the same amplitude. Now, I did mention at the beginning of this video that the cathode follower is one of the least understood of all tube circuits. And I think the reason is twofold. First, most of us who are playing with tubes today are building some form of audio amplifier. And there are very few of us who are building oscilloscopes, need to create a computer buffer, a regulated DC power supply, and even fewer still who are making tube-based impedance matching circuits. So to put it simply, most of us are just unfamiliar with the properties of a cathode follower and how those properties can be used in circuit design. Secondly, there are many circuits that have the word cathode in their titles, which can be very confusing to someone not familiar with all the terminology of tube circuit design. Add to this, the large number of circuits that use the signal coming off the cathode in some way are generally referred to as cathode followers in most texts. So one can see how confusion and misconceptions abound. I can't tell you the number of posts and videos I've seen somewhere online where someone is fascinated with the one half of a 12AX7 that the Fender basement takes its signal from. I've seen one video where people try to set up extra resistors and capacitors trying to bias the 12AX7 in some special way to get more gain out of that stage. Or they're looking for some special property in that 12AX7 that explains how the tone stack actually works, when in reality all it is is a high impedance source for the tone stack, so that the tone stack does not draw down from the amplified source. But that's another circuit.